Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Bell Reed, and thanks for tuning into this video. So, this is the first video in a new QA series where I pour myself a cup of tea and answer some questions that are asked from the amazing folks in my Patreon community. If you want to join in and submit a question for the next Q&A, you can do that by signing up at any tier on my Patreon page and then looking for the post that says submit your Q&A questions here. All right, so I have my tea. Let's get started. The first question comes from Imogen who asks, what is your advice on getting started with electronics and live processing of instruments? Awesome first question. Um, so my advice to someone who is new to the world of electronic music and plays an acoustic instrument um, would actually be to start off by exploring amplification. I know that that might seem a little bit strange, um, but this is actually how I got introduced to the world of electronic music, and I think it has some serious merit. So bear with me while I try to explain myself. When I, when I say amplification, I'm not just talking about putting a mic in front of your instrument to make it louder or to record it. Um, in particular, I'm talking about experimental approaches to amplification. So for example, I'm a trumpet player, um, so for me, this means putting microphones um, not only near the bell of my trumpet, but also inside the bell of my trumpet, which allows me to um, amplify all of the internal sounds of the tubing and the plumbing, the valves moving up and down, um, little quiet mouth sounds and clicking sounds, and of course air moving through the tubes, um, which are things that would normally not be audible, um, or not super audible at least, without that kind of amplification. Um, other instrumentalists could approach this in different ways. Uh, you could close mic um, objects on the top of a drum head, for example, to get really quiet, prickly sounds. Or you could try using a clip-on mic um, or a pickup, for example, on uh, you know a string instrument or something like that, or a brass instrument as well, for that matter. Um, you might also want to explore the use of contact mics. So you could put those, if you're a vocalist, you could put them on your throat or on your chest and amplify your voice that way and also the sounds of you breathing, inhaling and exhaling. Any kind of vibration that you create um, in your chest or your, your neck would be picked up by the contact mic. Um, again, contact mics are great uh, kind of all around instruments and tools and you could put them on any kind of instrument that would vibrate anything with a vibrating body um, so the reason why I suggest this as a first step into working with electronics is because for one um, you don't need a huge amount of new equipment um, it's possible that you even have a microphone lying around your house. Uh, if you go the contact mic route, you can buy a pre-made contact mic for under $10, um, or you can even build them yourself for just a few pennies, but you would need a few special tools like a soldering iron in order to do that. Um, I can leave a link below to uh, some pre-made contact mics for anyone who's interested. Um, the second thing is that Working with amplification in this way provides you with a stepping stone uh, without overloading you with gear to get you kind of thinking and hearing things in a sort of electronic way. Um, so this for me helped to build a new vocabulary and a new 
overall approach to my instrument um, that felt a lot more electronic um, before I actually went out and expanded my gear and bought pedals and modules and things like that. I was expanding my, my vocabulary on my current instrument, which was the trumpet. Um, I think I had a third thing, but let's see what it was. Oh, I remember. So the third reason why I, I am suggesting this is because again, as an acoustic instrumentalist, as you're working on kind of integrating electronics into your practice, um, especially if you want to do live processing, the mic that you're using and the way that you're using it, it's not just like an incidental thing. It's actually, um, in many ways part of your instrument. So when I'm performing, I tend to actually play the microphone in the same way that I play my, my trumpet or my modular synth. Um, I'll back off on the mic if I want things to sound a certain way and I'll get really close up on the mic if I want to achieve certain sounds. Um, for example, one thing that I love to do is actually create feedback from a microphone through my trumpet and I do this by putting the bell of my trumpet right up close onto the microphone which increases or reinforces certain resonant frequencies um, then you start to hear them as audible feedback and I can actually control their pitch and play them by moving the valves of my trumpet I think that you will have a lot of fun doing this. I think you'll discover a whole new vocabulary. I think you will discover a whole new sound world that is literally living inside of your instrument that maybe you never knew about. Um, and it is a valuable stepping stone toward getting you um, to the next stage, which would be actually starting to connect you know, external hardware or software instruments. Um, so speaking of that, what I would say then after, after amplification would be a valuable thing to do, um, would maybe be to explore, uh, a digital audio workstation or a software instrument environment such as Ableton. Um, Ableton in particular is a great place to start because it's really easy to just, um, set up your microphone and drag and drop different audio effects onto your audio channel. So if you're not sure how they work or which ones you even want, you don't really have to, you know, go out and buy expensive modules or pedals and learn how they work. You can just drag on a delay, listen to it, you know, kind of explore it, figure it out trial by error, move some things. If you don't like it, you can just delete it and then drag on a different effect and go from there. So it's a great way to get started pretty quickly and then also to learn how all of these different types of effects work. Uh, before I move on, I'll say one quick note about this whole experimental amplification thing. Um, please be careful with your microphones. If you're not sure if your mic can handle a lot of, um, you know, very up close sound pressure, uh, I'd err on the side of caution. Uh, contact mics for sure are super durable and can take a lot. Um, the mic that I use in my personal practice is an SM58. It's just a run of the mill vocal mic. It's nothing special. And actually it's built to be super durable. Um, so either I would recommend either an SM58 or something uh, similarly durable or um, exploring contact mics. All right, sip of tea. The second question comes from uh, Tethys. And the question is, what is your musical background? Um, is it from school or self-taught? Well, a little bit of both. Um, I have quite a lot of formal musical education from schools since I was a young, um, a young kid. I did conservatory music lessons um, as a child, and then I actually went to an arts-focused high school. Um, and then after that, I went to college for music. Um, the thing is, when I was doing all of that, I was very focused on 
classical music, um, classical piano, and classical trumpet. I thought that I was going to be an orchestral trumpet player. Um, but my personal interests shifted pretty significantly when I finished my undergraduate degree and I moved uh, out of the country to do my graduate studies. So when I was doing my grad studies, I was also supposed to be doing classical trumpet, or at least um, it was a little more contemporary trumpet, I guess, but I was still supposed to be focused on trumpet performance. Um, but what ended up happening is that I met a whole bunch of people who were doing imp free improvisation and noise music and circuit bending and audio coding and playing modular synths. And I just got sucked into that whole world um, and fascinated by it so deeply and so immediately. Um, it was kind of like an overnight shift. I had a couple of classes and a couple of mentors that were focused in on these areas. But for the most part, my uh, development in the electronic music world has been self-taught, either self-taught or learned in uh, from others, but in less formal, less of a formal institution setting. So lots of workshops and tutorials and that kind of thing. The next question is from C, and it says, does making an effects chain require different cables than the TS quarter inch cables you use in your no input mixer videos? Okay, um, so if I understand this question correctly, you are talking about adding effects into a no input mixer patch. So probably um, effects that are not on the mixing board itself, but using um, like uh, guitar pedals and things like that. Um, and if you are asking about that, then the answer is basically no. You don't need special cables um, in order to connect those. Uh, most guitar pedals, as far as I understand, use TS cables, quarter inch TS cables. So you could uh, use the same types of cables from your mixer out to your pedals and back again. Um, I use just those colorful uh, cables that you see in my videos. I think they're made by Hosa. Um, you could use, they, they do make shorter uh, quarter inch cables that are specifically intended to be used with pedals. Um, they're sh quite short and they have like 90 degree uh, angles where you patch them in. Um, and that is... Uh, is really just a matter of preference and kind of like organization so you don't have a total spaghetti factory of cables going on. Um, but yeah, I don't have those personally so I just embrace the cable chaos. All right, the next question is from Telemore. Uh, this is not quite a question, but it says it would be dope. It would be super dope to see your patching strategy with the surge modular. Okay. Yes. I would love to show you my patching strategy on the surge. Um, unfortunately it's going to have to wait till another video. Um, the surge paper face modular system that you see me using in a lot of my videos 
it's not actually my personal instrument. I uh, borrow it and I have it on loan from a studio that's nearby. So um, with the current quarantine in place, I don't have access to it right now. So sadly, I will have to hold on to this question and I will revisit it in a future video. All right, and the last question uh, is from Noise Dungeon. And the question is, is your work more about exploration or composition? Hmm, that's another really good question. Um, let's see, well, my so my knee-jerk reaction is to say both, but of course I think that's cheating a little bit. Um, I think that I think that at the heart of my work, uh, there's more of an emphasis on exploration than there is on composition. Um, everything that I do comes from a very experimental and curious perspective, I guess. And what I mean by that is when I'm working on a new project, um, even something that's commissioned from someone else um, or, you know, someone, if I'm recording tracks for someone else's album or something like that, um, I always try to start from a place where I am like a blank slate and I, I leave my preconceptions about how it might be or what it might sound like out of the studio. And I just try to enter into this space where I'm exploring and anything that happens could potentially be something to pursue further. Um, so, you know, I, there's no mistakes really, I guess is what I'm trying to say in this, in this way of working. Things might not go the way you plan. Things might not, you know, sound the way you thought they would sound. But what I try to embrace is the idea that the mistakes, the things that don't go well, shouldn't just be immediately thrown out. Um, they should be, you know, given a chance, pursued a little bit further. Um, uh, if you think about all of the different moments in time throughout history when artists discovered or invented feedback <laughs> in their own practice, like they were in their studio somewhere and for some reason an input went into an output which went into an input which went into an output or some loop started happening. Um, they were recording on top of something which was recording on top of something and they discovered feedback, right? And all of the times that those people, instead of just saying, oh my goodness, that's a terrible mistake, I delete it and start over, they heard that thing and they went, wow, that was really interesting. I wonder if I should, wonder what would happen if I did this to it or if I did that, or if I let that go a little further. And then they would be creating all of these like, you know, beautiful feedback driven pieces and entire art forms and genres emerged because of that kind of, uh, that kind of willingness to like go with the flow and not throw out something just because it didn't work well the first time. Okay, if you followed me all the way through that long, um, twisty tangent then congratulations um, I'm not even entirely sure I totally followed my own train of thought throughout that um, but anyway we have arrived at the end we made it through uh, thank you so much for tuning into this video thanks to everyone who submitted questions and thank you a very special thank you to all of the people in my patreon community
I am going to be running these Q and A's either once a month or once every two months. We'll see how it goes. So uh, again, if you'd like to submit your questions, you can do that on my Patreon page and uh, I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.